reminds me of when I was playing futures tennis qualifiers. Sometimes we would have like 140 guys show up on a Thursday to try to fill 128 spots for a draw the next day, which were filled on a point and ranking system all the way down to drawing out of a hat for some spots. If you got in, the goal was to win four rounds over the next four days just to get into the main draw. Then win one round, which would be an ATP point. Then you would have a world ranking and access to the Pro Tour. Like you could get into all the tournaments depending on how many points you ended up getting, but you now were in the club. Many times I played a few tournaments in a row and sometimes we'd go to the next one first or sometimes I would stay behind depending on whatever the situation was. Most of the time I went to the new site so I could be practicing there for the next tournament, but sometimes I stayed behind depending on if I won a round or two and would see when the main draw players showed up. I mean, you could tell right away they were different. Their height, their build, I mean, really, even the way they carried themselves, you could tell. Through the whole qualifier, I'd watched like amazing feats of athleticism and focus and, and pulling off crazy points to win matches. High level, up and coming collegiate athletes and, and juniors and pros from all over the world, all trying to break through and qualify for the main draw. And a select few of these people would earn their way into that main draw. And then they would play someone with just a few ATP points like 800 to 1200 in the world or something, probably 80% of them lose first round and don't get a point. Many times losing pretty bad. Then the top finishers in that main draw are the ones that are playing like the qualifiers and, and wild cards and stuff and losing first round in the next stage, which is called challengers. And the main draws of these are generally like 300 to 1000 in the world or something. Then there are those high level tournaments that are somewhere between the challengers and the grand slams. The ones you see on like a random TV or in some city that the top pros play. Bigger money, bigger points. And then we get to like the top hundred that are the ones that play in grand slams that you see on TV. These other players at every level below that will lose badly to those guys in the top hundred most of the times if they play them. And that's not even to mention Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic who beat all of them for 10 years here. Now, with 87 million tennis players worldwide, with billions of dollars generated annually, having a massive impact on the economies of the world alongside sports like football or soccer, basketball, table tennis, and cricket, to become one of the elite in any one of these sports comes from a combination of factors that has to come together just right for every athlete. Now, I'm not going to go into the full details here, but I'm just going to point out the obvious that the foundation of all sports and excelling in them is genetics. Anyone in the field of athletics knows this to be true and it's really not even open for debate. No matter how hard someone trains or gets mentally focused or whatever, they're never going to be a center in the NBA or a lineman in the NFL if they don't have the genetics for it. I guess technically without chemical assistance I'm saying. And this is just obvious factors like size. Then you have the genetics for all the other physical aspects like speed, endurance, strength, agility, and the intangibles like focus, intuition, and decision making. One of the most common paths for a pro athlete in any sport is that at a young age, they had the opportunity to play several sports. And at some point, the opportunities and abilities matched up best with one of them. So they focused on it to become the best that they could be. Probably putting in more than 10,000 hours of blood, sweat, and tears. Years of muscle memory and mental training to hone their ability to play this sport. Committing their life to this quest. So generally, this decision is based on the perceived long-term value of being good at whatever sport it is that they're going to choose. Now you have pickleball. Yes, it is the fastest growing sport in the United States. But right now, there are like 5 million players, and even the top few pros barely make six figures if they know how to do clinics and are good at sponsorships. Just in the past year or so, there's been a handful of tennis players that have come in and started to beat the top pros pretty much right away. Yes, it was singles, but anyone watching can tell that they're just following up with doubles right afterwards, and it does take a little longer to adjust from tennis to the doubles. We're talking about some like programmed instincts that have to be rewired. And I'm definitely not talking down the tennis level of the top pros that are in pickleball right now, because they were and are world-class tennis players. But unless I'm missing or forgetting somebody, none of the top pickleball pros ever were in that beyond that challenger stage, even in their prime. Maybe DeHart or Rettenmeyer, they were both top 100 give or take, but they definitely played the pro tennis tour for years. And if you didn't know who was who and they were out just practicing with 
you know, Federer or Nadal. You wouldn't even know who was going to win until they started playing out points. The difference is so nuanced, but the people who know, know. Fortunately in tennis, it's pretty obvious that the average person wouldn't even get a racket on a serve from Djokovic or Isner. And it takes a bit of work to even really rally a tennis ball. And I, I think most people get that. 